Hello, Claire. Hi, Paul. How are you going? I'm good, thank you. Here we are back for our second segment of this live stream. For those of you who are watching on Facebook, I'm going to just drop a comment. Uh, there we go. Asking people to come over to Instagram because that's where Claire and I are discussing this. But I'm going live on Facebook just to somewhat bring you guys into this but really to prompt you to come over to Instagram. I'm just going to write this comment real quick, Claire. If you see sure. any comments worth, worthy of um, response, by all means, feel free. Yep, lovely. Got a lot of people joining around the world. Hello from Italy. Um, people are asking where everyone is. I'm in the Blue Mountains in Sydney. Paul's in Melbourne. Great to see so many people here. Ah, we have somebody from Turkey. I once learnt um, a lot of Turkish, actually. I'm not fluent by any means now. I don't think I'd get by, but uh, my Turkish used to be quite good. <laughs> That's interesting. Little fun fact about Claire I didn't realise. <laughs> this call is Chok Kalabuluk. <laughs> Ireland. Scotland. <laughs> The interesting thing is, why did Claire learn Turkish? <laughs> well, now you've spilled the beans. Why don't you give us the full story? <laughs> oh, well, I was, um, uh, it started off with a sad story. It was actually my, after my mother died, actually. And I just got a backpack and went off on my own and, and traveled around Turkey for a month. Met some really interesting people and um, um, met a man, of course, and uh, <laughs> did a bit of traveling and uh, came back and started going to lessons. So it was a brilliant month, just what I needed at that time, just what my mother would have liked me to do as well, I'm sure. <laughs> That's a cool story. I <laughs> um, just want to say there's so many people joining from around the world, different parts of the world, Indonesia, France, Germany, uh, these are just the ones I'm seeing in front of me now. Netherlands, California, Wales, India. Did I say that? You said Turkey, yeah. e Egypt, yeah. uh, Ireland, uh, the UK. So, guys, thank you for joining. We're here doing a second segment um, of this discussion about mental health and animal rights activism. The last one was about a week ago. It's up on my YouTube channel if you haven't seen it. You can check it out on YouTube later. Um, yeah, thank you guys for joining. Um, this is an important discussion. Um, wow, we've got someone joining from Nigeria. All parts of the globe. Um, Ukraine. Uh, I've actually worked in the Ukraine. <laughs> the older you get, you realize you've uh, <laughs> many years ago, yeah. Wow. <laughs> So many stories we could probably get into about these things. People also <laughs> letting us know where they're joining from on Facebook. We've got South Africa, Ohio, Greece, uh, New Zealand. So, yeah. Um, all right. So let's get into it, shall we? Because we've only got an hour and I really want to give people lots of value with this. And this segment will also go up on my YouTube as a part two. Um, for those of you who don't know what my YouTube is, it's just Paul Bashir. You can find it by searching that. Um, so where did we leave off? I think we essentially talked about, you know, the subtleties of the nuances that go in, like the subtle nuances that go into mental health regarding um, this line of work, you know, being an animal rights activist and how mental health is a big part of what we do. I think some of the feedback I got from the last live stream that I think is most um, pertinent. Um, I'm just going to silence Sverage. He's in our comments. Um, in fact, yeah, before I get into what I was just about to get into, um, I also just want to say that, you know, for this live stream, please keep the comments relevant. You know, if you are just a troll or an anti-vegan, you're getting blocked for this. This is too important for you to... Mm -hmm. Um, model up our comment section. If you are vegan, if you're an animal rights activist, you're here joining us for 
the discussion, the topic that we're here to discuss, then please keep your comments relevant because in the last stream, um, a lot of the relevant comments were being like buried um, by irrelevant comments. So don't do that. Um, yeah, if you could just keep the comments relevant, we'd all appreciate that. The point of this is to get a feel for what you guys need in terms of mental health support. And so if the comments are relevant, it will help Claire and myself to know how we can provide you guys with value to support your mental health needs. So back to what I was saying, the feedback mainly that I got um, from the last stream was one, I didn't realize that mental health was a part of your health. I saw it as something separate, which was a point I made on that live stream. Um, okay, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to keep uh, an eye on the comments while we, while we continue. The other point that I think was the most helpful for people was, um, you know, understanding that we all go through this shit with family, with friends, with co-workers. And we all experience the same shit from non-vegans, essentially. We're all in this together. Um, yeah. Soon Jay's getting blocked. And that's the last comment I'm making about you guys who are anti-vegans in the comments. I'm not even going to mention you next time. You're just getting blocked. And we're just going to continue with the discussion. Uh, yeah, so they were the most helpful things is like people sort of relating to the fact like to, to relating to others, re relating to what we had to say. It seemed like we were speaking to what they were going through. And um, I think sort of realizing that you're not alone, you know, um, that was one of the biggest things that people got value out of the last stream. But yeah, also understanding that mental health is a part of your health. I mean, how is it not, right? I was actually making the statement that it's number one. And this is something that I've come to learn only in recent history, the last year or so. But it makes sense. Your mental state determines everything because everything starts from a thought, your attitude, your even your feelings. You choose a thought, whether subconsciously or con consciously or unconsciously, and uh, the thought dictates how you feel. And then the feeling is then going to dictate your physical state and et cetera. So it, generally speaking correct me if i'm wrong you're the psychologist here claire but you know your health um is very much from my understanding predetermined by your thoughts and your mental state um i mean it's not i don't mean this is a blanket statement across the board in all cases but generally speaking um what do you think about that statement yeah no i, I don't think we can separate it actually i think we've been brought up to separate mind and body and actually that goes back um, a few thousand years, that separation philosophers did, but we can't. Um, and someone asked, I think last week, you know, what is mental pain, the anguish that we feel knowing about what we know? And I thought about that and I thought, well, really is what our minds make of our feelings. Now, we cannot see those things without there being a visceral reaction. If we're not a psychopath, which most people aren't, we do have them in the world. We also have sociopaths, don't seem to have any empathy. The difference between that, by the way, a sociopath is someone that fails to have any empathy or feeling or conscience. But a psychopath is someone who gratuitously enjoys doing these things. But on, on the whole, most people aren't, of course. Um, they may be cut off from their feelings, but most people aren't. And so when we see or know or talk about these things um, be reminded of them there is a visceral reaction we get a feeling and then it's what are the story we attach to it the hopelessness the the shock you know what, what's wrong with people how can we live in this horrible world people are evil we go around the houses and, and I think one of the big thing that came up last week was people's families people that are otherwise pretty okay people although that's not always the case for a lot of families um, how is it possible? So, no, I think you're absolutely right, Paul, but they're intimately related. If our physical health suffers, suffers, and I think I said last week, 90% of serotonin, one of the happy hormones, the hope, the well-being sort of thing, is produced in the gut. So if we take scant attention and we eat just processed foods, that we're going to be doing a bit of a battle uphill, particularly with the sort of stuff we've got to deal with. That's a good point, too. Yes, um... 
you are what you eat, as they say. So, um, and we have neuro, um, a neuro network in our guts, right? So it mm. does connect to our brain. But I think your your mental state and what you, how, how you think essentially is is so important. It's so dramatically important for your success in animal rights activism. The other point from last week that I think needs to be reiterated is that the purpose of this discussion that you and I are having, Claire, is to make activists more active than they currently are, not the other way around because this mental health discussion and self-care in this movement is discussed usually um, in a way that leads to people doing less activism so that's not the goal with this discussion so if you're interested in being more active than you currently are but just having the mental support so that you can be strong and healthy mentally while you do this then this is for you so, yeah, let's get further into this, Claire. Um, the thing with family, I think we covered in the last stream is that we just can't believe it's our own people, people who even look like us, who have known our whole lives, who have been closest to than anyone else, closer to them than we've been close than we've been with anyone else. And you know, we have an affinity that's undeniable with our family, and to hear their non-vegan nonsense. Um, is really painful. It's really, really painful. Um, I tell people that ask me, like, how should I outreach my family to essentially outreach them like you outreach everybody because you should be showing everybody the same kind of, you know, what, what I say in my workshops now is that this is the real form of compassion when you just simply tell people the truth and hold them accountable because, you know, should they go vegan, they will thank you for that in future that is true love and compassion to tell somebody the truth and to not pander and compromise on that truth so i say talk to your parents just like you would anybody else be as you know detailed as you need to be with them as you are with everybody else um but it's harder to deal with family you know on your mental state um but I just want to put this out to you guys in the comments. If there's anything specific you need support with, then please let us know in the comments. Because again, this is what it's all about. We're doing field research right now to find out what you guys need support on specifically as animal rights activists who are within the AV network. We're assuming you guys do street activism with us. You're doing cubes of truth, which means you're confronting people directly to their faces and that's got to be tough. I, I know it is. I've been doing it for five straight years and I oversee, you know, hundreds of chapters around the world who also do it. And I know that mental health support strategies, resources, tools will be something that will be of interest to a lot of you who are out there doing this. Um, again, let us know in the comments though, throughout this discussion, um, I'm taking note from what you guys are saying on Instagram, Facebook, the comments will be there indefinitely. We can read them back, but we will curate a package for you guys or something that, that Claire will put together to give you guys the proper resources. I think that was one of the things we were talking about, Paul, is, is resilience in many ways, because um, in fact, if you, we look at, let's take veganism out of it at the moment you know we hear about people getting burnt out you know we've got family members maybe people on the call have got burnt out with a project they've done or a, you know some work situation and the, you know there's obviously physical and emotional exhaustion but it's when you one suddenly sort of gives up it's the hopelessness that happens and i think it's we hear about burnout in this area and it's when people go anything i do won't make a difference and, and I agree with you, and we've talked about this over the years, Paul, is we don't have the luxury to do that. Um, and sometimes people need to step back. And I think, you know, to regularly keep putting credit back in the emotional bank. But the animals need us there. What we witness with our eyes is nothing relative to what they feel with their bodies. That's why everybody's here. And this is why people give their lives to this. And we owe that to the animals. So I think it's also helping each other as well. Um, and supporting each other we see a lot of unkindness in the movement don't we paul people you know having a go at each other 
And um, but funny enough, I've been reading a really cool book called The Five Acts of Ki The Five Benefits of Kindness. And it's, it's some really cool research of when we are kind to other people, when we support people, we give them a helping hand, we encourage others rather than criticizing them for not doing enough or whatever. There's all these amazing side effects in terms of our happiness, our we feel more agency in the world, our relationships are better, our physical and mental health is actually better. By when we're actually having a go at other people and feel they're not doing enough or we feel they're a bit welfareist or something, you know, actually attacking people, it's bad for us. It changes our physical state. It results ultimately in burnout. So I think we are the instruments of change. And what we think is actually thoughts are things, things, <laughs> you know, um, they do. When we think a negative thought, when we're angry, for instance, um, up to about 20 minutes after an outburst, um, our immune system is weakened. There is immediately adrenaline and cortisol put in the body. It acid acidifies the body. Um, it takes us a while to come back from that. You know that awful churning feeling we feel with an angry at people? We've all done it. And, um, you know, I know I'm going to be out walking um, in the, with my dogs or something, and um, I'm, somebody will come in, they say some ridiculous comment, and, you know, then you outreach to them, and they make some ridiculous comment. And you can feel that, you know, you say what you need to say and um, you hopefully you lay out the feast in front of them. And but they give the signals they don't want to go any further. That doesn't mean they're not going to go away and digest it. But it's easy for us to walk away, isn't it? And think, I can't believe what I just said. And we turn it over in our minds. We can learn ways to to switch that very quickly, but without distracting ourselves. We distract ourselves. We depress it. We become depressed. You know, finding a way to debrief with other people to turn that, um, excuse my language, shit into compost, really, which is what we want to do, is the positive action. And um, and there's some, I put a couple of meditations that I've done to create a vegan world on my website. Because when we slow down our brain waves, we teach ourselves to move to a neural memory of something positive. When we have those angry arguments within ourselves or somebody presses a button and we go down that path of things churning over long after they've walked away, we can learn to switch ourselves to the other. And that means it doesn't make that person go away, but it means that we're back on the game and we're able to be the best instrument for animals. So we need to use the neuroscience here to you know, change our thoughts, but not distract ourselves because it only comes back to bite ourselves. Yeah, people are saying I don't agree with you <laughs> by my oh. facial expression, I'm assuming. I don't know what they're saying I don't agree with you on. Perhaps you guys could let me know in the comments what you think I disagree yeah. with Claire on. Um, there may be some things that we disagree on, but so far I don't have any disagreements with what Claire has just said. Um, I've openly disagreed with Claire in the past. <laughs> I remember you got off stage at World Vegan Day and I said, I disagree with you about one point. I'd like to discuss it with you, but I love the rest of your speech. Um, yeah, no, we have no issue with disagreeing with each other. Yeah. It's not about, um, we're not having this discussion because we agree 100% on everything. Yeah. I'm trying to hack into Claire's resources regarding mental health so that you guys in the AV network can get benefit out of it. So yeah. that's what we're doing. Actually yeah, someone's just said, actually, you know, I hurt all the time and and it is, it's painful. I mean, I've been a vegan for 11 years and I became an activist at the same time and I can still be brought to my knees. You know, it's never going to be okay, this stuff. So, um, in fact, I'll tell a little personal story without going into too much details. One of my um, lovely um, senior animals that lived with me had a, an accident this week and, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, at the vets trying to help that animal who's now recovered and doing rehabilitation but i realized that that tapped into my pain about what is happening to animals that just are you know suffering at the moment um who don't have that sort of care don't have a painkiller don't have anything that can be you know somebody tending to them um and we know these animals are suffering now but i, I wonder if other people experience this too is when we we see suffering with someone say close to us or we stub our toe it can be as simple as that for me and I'm immediately taken to that place of, oh, my gosh, what is it like to feel X, Y, Z, you know, which is nothing to stubbing your toe. But, I, you know, it, it actually taps into that. So it's always going to be there. Um, and I think, you know, resourcing ourselves is going to be important to stay the course here. But it, it hurts. 
of course it does. There's no good news here when we know what is going on. Can't, we don't want to be numb to this. That's really important. Um. Yes, that is important. We don't want to be robots about this. Um, Claire, lots of comments on Facebook. Um, we can go through these comments. Um, those yeah. comments, like later, obviously, um, uh, these comments that pertain to AV or me, I'll respond to. Um, but any comments regarding like mental health um, challenges, perhaps you could jump in the comments on Facebook after this. Um, sure. Okay. Sure. So I'm just looking at some of the comments so far. Um, someone's asking about recommendations on how to straight uh, to ha how to be straightforward when debating. Um, I would recommend you go and watch my latest workshop, which is called "Holding Non-Vegans Accountable 2.0." Um, I'm planning on doing another one in a few months, but that's the latest and greatest one that we have. It's on the Anonymous for the Voiceless YouTube channel. Just search that up and you'll find it. That's what I recommend. Um, yeah, so what else? What else can we uh, discuss here? Yeah. Oh, there's one comment here a... um, from, from Chuck. Let me just bring this up, Claire. Um, Paul, you're yeah. highly critical and stern. Claire doesn't advocate the same way. Do we, is that, is that relevant to what we're discussing? Do you think Claire? Of course we advocate differently. Um, you know, I'm a street activist. Um, you know, perhaps my style is different because I do the work that I do is a bit different. Right. So do you have anything to say to that Claire? Yeah, well, it's interesting, and I think we've got to bring our own personalities to this, and uh, we've all got a different style. There's one sure thing, um, and people come to you know veganism for different reasons. Different reasons. I mean, I came by learning about what happens to animals in slaughterhouses. I just read a book, and gosh, the images were strong enough for me to go and do some homework. And 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 some people push away from that. We hear. They come through a different, you know, they don't need to see things that we're seeing, but they can have a visual image and they change. But I think our style has to be different. I think with family as well is when we're on the street and we're looking at the footage and we're sort of holding it open and we're jointly looking together, we're right into the conversation. With family, of course, we get these backhanded jibes. We get this, these few comments. We've got to, you know, it's not on the table. We've almost got to bring, keep bringing them back to this. Um, it's not so direct. And so, you know, we're we've constantly got to keep chipping away as it were. And, and if they say they don't want to hear, it's asking them, what do you think I'm going to tell you? You know, don't let them get away with that. <laughs> um, or I can't bear to see, oh gosh, don't show me. I can't bear to see it. Well, what is it you think you, you're actually not seeing? And then they have to get an association in their head. They have to get an image. Um, you know, I don't like to think what happens to animals. What do you think is going on? What do you think it's like for them? You know, it's we get them to imagine and the word imagine is really powerful because we're used to knowing that when we're kids, we're brought up with stories and things. Imagine this, you know, and we get them to pull within themselves because when they cringe in many ways, that means they're affected in some way. They know it's something they don't want to see. The indifferent ones are the, are the problem that, you know, we got to decide whether we spend our time on them. Um, I will leave them to, to find their own way. And, and in the end, they'll just follow anyway, because most people like that are just following what the crowd are doing. They're not thinking for themselves and, and trying to align their values with their actions. Mm. Yes. Um, so again, lots of people saying it's hard to deal with, you know, non-vegans being around non-vegans. Um, oh, yeah. Like I said in the last stream, that they constantly tell us that, we have taken the wrong path. We're subscribing to an extreme regime. You know, we've gone to the dogmatic end of things here. We're religious zealots. We, you know, have lost our way and we're the crazy weirdos and everybody else is perfectly normal. Um, we're the ones to mock and point at. The other thing that I think needs to be considered is dealing with vegans because I got to be honest, since I started doing animal rights activism, 
that has been the most impactful on my mental health. It actually hasn't been dealing with non-vegans. As much as it's maddening, and it is maddening, non-vegans pale in comparison to the kind of shit that you deal with from vegans. What can we get into regarding that subject, Claire? Yeah, but it's, you know, you're absolutely right. And I know, again, it's something we've talked about. And and I think it's, I think it's doubly painful because I think what happens is that we think we found our tribe gosh, at least these people understand me, at least they're in the pot and we expect them to, to get on with them in, in, in all sorts of ways. And then we realise that sometimes the only thing we have in common is that they don't eat animals. <laughs> and, uh, and I think we've got to realise that is just because somebody has woken up about this and to me it is, for me it's the most painful thing I've had to deal with in my life. And, you know, I've been a psychologist 30 years. I've dealt in, I've worked in homicide. I've worked in all sorts of areas. But just the sheer size of the problem and the sheer normalization of such horror story. So when people come to that, it doesn't mean that they've done any work in other areas. So people sort of, you know, behave badly towards, you know, other vegans. You're not vegan enough. You're not abolitionist enough. Um, you know, you're a bad example for, for vegans or why are you worrying about humans, for instance? You know, um, there's lots of things going on in our world at the moment. There's a lot of polarized views about what's happening with our world situation. And people often, instead of asking questions and saying, look, I'm intrigued, you're an animal activist or you're a vegan, why are you so interested? You know, there's this attacking. So unless people are like them often or in a particular area, in whatever direction that is, um, there's that resistance. So. I think, don't think we can assume that because someone is vegan, um, we're totally in the same tribe. <laughs> it just means that um, they've actually, you know, lifted the veil and, uh, and not going along with the dystopia, which we experience around us. Um, but, you know, I'm a great one for choose your own battles, you know, and also don't do all the heavy lifting is all the things that get said to us. You know, the first comment you were talking about, Paul, these crazy comments we have, you know, you're... My, some of my family think I'm in a cult. I find that amusing when I get them to, because um, they, they actually break down what being a vegan is, you know, or what the philosophy is, you know, it's, it's a non-use and exploitation of animals. So you've got to get that back to them and then ask them what part of that is not a desirable thing to be doing. Um, but don't do all the heavy lifting. So when people throw all these questions at us, stop defending yourself, do what you do in activism, ask questions. What do you mean by that? When you say I'm that, can you explain it? What makes you say that? You know, it's, um, and don't even answer about what a vegan is. Don't defend what veganism or activism is. Get them to tell you what it is. And then they'll say some ridiculous thing like a fussy diet and then we can put them right. Because if it comes out of their mouth, they form that image and we've got a better way of actually then putting it to them. But with the, the vegans is, you know, it's about choosing our friends. It's about being generous to other people as well but also be boundary. We don't have to put up with nonsense. And um, I think be the vegan you wish you had met before you became one. I think that's always a good maxim. I like that one. Um, and all of us say, don't we, Paul, I wish I knew all those years ago what I know now, I'd be vegan now. And when I say vegan, I'm, you know, obviously I'm talking about um, nothing to do with plant-based. I'm talking about, you know, that ethical stance. And I love what you've always said, Paul, it's nothing special about being a vegan. Um, it just means you've come back to ground zero. That's all it means. Now the work begins. And that's the, we don't need more diets. We need more activists. <laughs> yeah, what's some of the stuff that you've dealt with from vegans, Claire? That would be an interesting thing for people to hear. Like what are the, some yeah. of the, the backlash or the, the claims that are made about you? Yeah. Mm. I guess I see people from a lot of different areas. So I do a lot of speaking, do a lot of workshops, but also come, people come to see me individually. So if people come to see me individually, of course, they're usually about the anguish of being a vegan or other life problems, but they just refuse to work with a non-vegan, um, which I can understand because I would be and have been in that same situation too. So in terms of um, the sort of backlash, I've seen... It's more what I've observed, I think, on social media. People behave very badly when they're not standing in front of someone. You know, let's just think about that for a moment. Some of the things that are said, if somebody, is it the same as when someone is face to face? It's often not. So people are not too taking that ownership. It's those disparaging, 
horrible comments of, you know, laughing at someone, undermining them, but just being vicious, you know? But I think we've got to see a bigger picture here because if you've seen any of the documentaries, if anybody's seen them, there's two of them. There's Plugged In and then there's Social Dilemma. You know, social media, when it's, you've got to realize it's, it's orchestrated by, it's a great vehicle for us to use. Of course it is. That's how we all, all come together tonight. But it's orchestrated by major corporations making a lot of money and selling a lot of advertising for pulling together types of people that people can advertise to. And Social Dilemma and Plugged In was about when they set that up as behavior modification, because the more hype and the more arguments and pressing buttons in people, um, the more you get attention, that becomes a page that is followed and they sell more advertising and they openly talk about this on there. So we've got to realize that people behave badly because at some unconscious level almost, they are being jerked into reacting in a way they'd never do before. Each of us here on this call, who hasn't seen a comment and you say in your head, oh my gosh, and we, if we put that down in writing, um, you know, people, it would cause a lot of grief. You know, I do experience that reaction often, but it's having that stop and actually realize that that is partly because the medium's been set up to do that as a sort of, you know, we, we get annoyed by that where we're a bit sort of addicted into it is to stop at the moment and actually ask yourself the question, would I say that face to face? So I think it's those sort of, but really vicious comments, Paul, um, trying to also, I've seen people, trying people pull out people's personal lives. You know, someone's having a fling with someone else in a, a cube or a group and whatever, and they just think it's valuable to, to put that on there to shame them. And my first question is, is, you know, how does that serve the animals? You know, that might really, or and I constantly say to people, if you're attacking other people for whatever reason, always remember the non-vegans watching, the meat and livestock industries, the whole industries are there. Some of these uh, trolls that we see are paid to do this. They don't really get on there that quick. They're not waiting for AV to come on a live stream. They're paid to do this because they're there to drill other people down to think, oh my God, decent people are behaving like this. And often they're not. So... Um, so realize that, that, you know, other people are watching, but there are some genuine people out there. They're going to go, well, that's the vegan community. God, I don't want to be involved or I'm a vegan, but I don't want to be an activist. So, you know, act as if how you would want it to be, you know, and other people to treat you, I guess. Yeah, I think a really big point that you made earlier is that vegans are just people who are vegan. That doesn't mean necessarily you're going to get along with them on any other factor. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, I have said in the past, what is so special necessarily about not being an animal abuser in your actions? I mean, I know that it's the norm in this society, but when you really think about it objectively, vegans are just people that agree that animal abuse is wrong and are acting like it. That's not so special. That should be the norm. Veganism shouldn't even be a word as perfectly communicated through the movie Carnage. If anybody hasn't seen that, I would highly recommend watching that. It's a fantastic take on what I think resembles the future for, for veganism. Well, it may not exactly go down like that, but it's a pretty good breakdown of what it's going to be like when this movement becomes um, successful and we start seeing the fruits of our labor and essentially what will happen is the word veganism will become no longer. There'll be no word for not abusing animals, just like there's no word for not abusing humans. And that's the whole point of this is rooting out human supremacy from the equation, making animals some kind of subordinate entity, some sub entity to us. You know, the whole point is to have moral consideration for any living, any living being that suffers in all the ways that matter like we do. And so there'll be no word for veganism. It would just be the norm. And um, understand that vegans aren't your allies. They're not your friends. They're just people. Well, not necessarily. In fact, it's very rare that you're going to meet people who you consider your comrades in this. Truly, if you look at things objectively and you don't just act from emotion and excitement when you first meet them, 
especially when you first go vegan, lots of new vegans think that every vegan is their friend and their allies. Um, it's a huge mistake I've made in the past, especially in the beginning stages of AV. I brought people in that I thought were friends into what I was doing with AV with Asal. And we worked with them. And then they tried to claim that what we were doing was theirs and we were stealing it from them. And we were just blown away that people would act this way. And it's happened time and time again since then. It hasn't stopped happening. And it won't stop happening because vegans are just human beings that yeah. simply agree that not abusing animals is the way that you ought to live. And they're acting that way. So, yeah, don't fall into the trap of thinking that other vegans are your friends, your, your comrades, your allies. Um, it takes, they have to earn that. You know, it takes really being uh, a discerning and objective person to assess whether someone fits that role or not. Just like you do in general, or you should do in general with people. Um, but I think we get excited because being vegan is a narrow path in this world. Um, we feel isolated. And when we meet people who are on the same path, we want to latch onto them and be like, you're my best friend forever. You know, like almost immediately, um, let's go out and eat at a vegan restaurant, you know. Um, just be careful, be extremely careful and take this from experienced people that it's not, it's just not how this works. Um, you know, yeah. sorry, Paul, something you were, when you were just asking me, it just reminded me when you said, what's the worst bit of the bullying or the vegan thing is, is the competition. And I think you've seen that at AV is, you know, AV is where a lot of people, right from the beginning, whatever activism they're doing now, whether they're still involved in AV or somewhere else, is where people cut their teeth on, um, on street activism. And we do have some egos that come into this and they think, I want to do it differently, you know? And, and instead of going, well, therefore, I'll step away from this because, you know, the power of AV, of course, is it's a recognizable brand around the world. And that is important in terms of that repeated exposure to people, this, you know, the perception in the heads of, gosh, I was in XYZ place and they were there too, you know, is a sense of something building up, I'll find out more. But I think when people, their egos get involved and they want to do it their way or, um, it's, you know, for some people, they've found a tribe of people and there's a bit of ego to be liked or to be a hero, to be, you know, and we've got to keep our egos in check here because it's really not about us here. That's one really important thing. But one thing I'm also think I'm, I've also found out is um, I do a lot of, um, I, I attend a vigil every um, month at the, um, one of the big hospitals in Sydney where we know they're doing xenotransplantation, which is human animal experimentation growing organs, I'm sorry to distress people even more, you may know about it already, but growing organs to uh, the causes of them having damaged organs is a, because of the diet they're eating primarily. Um, and people get on really well together. And often we don't even know what they do as their day job <laughs> um, because the common cause is there. And, and in fact, I remember working with someone for a year there and we didn't know, and it kind of didn't matter because we were all there together on this thing. Some people would pair off and make friends or small groups, but it didn't matter. It was sort of, um, if it had been important, that person probably would have raised it if it was significant to them. Um, but I think we can often find that when we're out in the field, when we're doing whatever we're doing as activists, is just keep, you know, be cautious, you know, make friends in the same way you ever would. Friends, that one-to-one -one relationships, friendships, families, the reason people really, if they're good relationships, they're based on values. And yes, we've got that core overriding value, but then other people may have ones about loyalty, fairness, um, competition, I don't know, um, all sorts of things. So, you know, choose your friends wisely. But, you know, I've seen some comments there, you know, often people are isolated. People are in a small town in the Midwest of the US or something. It really is tough. Um, and I think it's quite frustrating for me sometimes because I may have, say, one-to-one -one, um, sessions with someone around the, um, the world and, I, and someone says, oh, I feel so lonely. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, I know someone in your same state, but it's kind of inappropriate for me to say that I know this other person. And um, so I might actually find out, you know, what active group are they in or online group and then suggest it to another because 
social support is really important when we are dealing with horror and grief and sadness and social support is one of the key things that helps us work through that so we need good support not people that are going to bring us down so seek out the people that you really want to be around yes yes um hmm Okay, so where should we take this discussion from here? We've got about 15 minutes left. Yeah. Um, I would like this discussion to end with some kind of resource toolkit yeah. that we can give people. Um, yeah. But what else is there to discuss here? Let us know in the comments if we're missing anything mm -hmm. that you think we should be covering, guys. Um, yeah. yeah, we're here yeah, to discuss how we can support yeah. Um, our mental health as animal rights activists and which are the ways that you need support specifically um, if we haven't already covered it yeah let us know as I've always said to you Paul what's really important I think is that we do put regular daily routines in place and I've come across a lot of activists that almost feel guilty for taking care of themselves their every spare bit of time has to be doing outreach now I'm all for increasing our activism, but to feel guilty when you have that little bit of, you know, putting that, I call it credit back in the bank sort of thing, is watching a funny movie or, you know, going out for a bite to eat with people, is choose not to feel guilty. You know, I think a lot of it is not guilt, it's shame. We feel we're bad people if we do it or whatever. Um, and the animals don't need us to be having that heaviness around them. They need us to be resourced. And so I'm a great advocate for, because people say to me, how do you keep positive, you know, um, I came across, um, you know, what was going on in slaughterhouses, um, gosh, 30 years ago. <laughs> All right. Um, gosh, I'm going to say it, it was 40 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I became a vegetarian, wow. you know, and it's largely because I didn't know a vegan. I didn't know what. I didn't have any idea, like most people, we know the arguments, why do people come? But as soon as I came aware of it, I couldn't believe no one told me. And that's the thing about this movement is growing. I actually became vegan before I knew such a word existed. For me, I didn't care if it was gonna be the worst diet on the planet, I was never gonna be part of that, eggs and dairy and everything else. So everybody, the average mechanic knows the word vegan, even if they don't know the true meaning of it. But. And people often ask me, how do you remain, you know, positive? Because you, you know, I talk to a lot of people doing undercover work. I talk to a lot of people making documentaries that are harrowing. Um, you know, people that like our, ourselves on this call that, you know, every week looking at those videos, it's never going to be okay. And, and new information that comes out. And for me, it's about each day creating the foundation for our mental health which means it's basics. It's having a good whole food plant-based diet. It's, yeah, we all eat some other things and that's great too, but ultimately your physical has to support your mental. If you know, it affects your mood, there's no doubt about it. And when we, that then that escalates, sorry, sort of de-escalates sort of thing. And um, I do yoga. I've done it for 40 years. Do I do hours on end? No, I haven't got the patience or the willpower probably, but I do do 10 to 15 minutes, four or five times a week. So I don't feel um, a lot of stiffness in my body. But that resources and grounds you. There's something very powerful about that. Drinking a lot of water, getting adequate sleep. That is really important with post-traumatic stress um, issues. Um, I think I might have talked a little bit about sleep last time, but can I say something here, Paul? Because it is so crucial to us regenerating each day. Great. I agree with you. I've recently been experiencing such a big difference in my own mental health from sleeping. Um, here's a little fun fact that I learned about sleep and let me know if you know anything about this, Claire. We ought to be asleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and midnight, but I actually think it's 1 a.m. So those three hours, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. If we're not fast asleep during those hours, we miss out on three of the most critical hours, according to the way the cosmic cycle works, for deep sleep, for regenerative sleep. And if we don't get that, our brain is an organ, our bodies heal when they sleep, when we're asleep because we're not emitting energy and therefore your body can use its energy to focus on healing and regenerating organs and your body 
which whatever it needs. Um, if you're not giving your brain that, you're not giving your body that, it's going to be really difficult for you to have a, a high level of mental health. Um, if you're not able to, because of because of your work or something, um, sleep during those hours, then at least getting what you need, which is usually at least six, seven hours, sometimes even eight, nine, um, depending on the day. Um, if as long as you're getting that many hours sleep, then that's going to be really good for your brain. But one critical thing I found in my own life is my quality of health um, and the impact of sleep on my health is so dramatically different when I, when I am asleep during those three hours from 10 to one. Like if I'm in bed and asleep by 10 PM, um, man, I wake up so much more refreshed. The next day, my mental health is so much stronger. Um, huge, huge thing that I've learned. What do you think about that, Claire? I totally agree with you. I think um, it's worth people, unless you're on shift work, which it really makes it difficult to test this out. Test it out yourself. We've all come back from a late night and we get to bed at one o'clock. It doesn't matter if you lie until nine o'clock. It's never going to be as refreshed. Largely to do with the light on the brain, I think, and um, what we call the circadian rhythm, which is that whole balance of, you know, the Monday morning feeling for people, if they get that, you know, that common sort of phrase that's used is because we we forced ourselves into a 24 hour cycle. But in fact, it's actually a little bit less than that. So when, if we're not, if we're in a, say, a nine sort of Monday to Friday working and many people perhaps on the call are, and um, then on Saturday and Sunday, we may lie in a little bit or stay up a little bit later. And our brain sort of our body sort of free wheels and tries to go back to normal. But we when we wake up on the Monday, it's as if we've woken up two hours earlier. So we you know, that's a good example of how this kind of works. And um, one of the best bits of advice I've heard from you know, sleep researchers is go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time. And it's so basic, but it is absolutely, it's so true. And most, a lot of people say, oh, I don't need as much sleep. There are very, very few sleep disorders. And if you can't sleep, it doesn't mean you've got a disorder. It's through habit, it's through cortisol, it's eating late at night, it's problems and worries that you're not processing properly. But on the whole, all of us need seven and a half to eight hours. In fact, all mammals do. Insects sleep as well. We need this. But there's something very important. Why This is why, and we are, many um, vegans can get into a post-traumatic stress syndrome because, of course, it's post-traumatic, what we're seeing. And what we find, say, with people that have been in war situations or there's been a tsunami and they've lost their families, they're in such a state of shock and they're in that fight and flight and the, the body tries to keep us alert to deal with the danger is when the person falls asleep exhausted, cortisol, the stress hormone, wakes them up. So then they wake up or they've had a nightmare or something. And therefore, they're not getting the quality sleep they need. And increasingly, as we go through the cycles, there's about four of them we go through over that eight hour period. As we're going one, two, three, we're increasingly having that rapid eye movement sleep. But the person who's traumatized, who wakes up with the, the nightmare or whatever, they're sort of not able to do that. And they're never totally able to process the enormity of the suffering they've had. And researchers have now found something really cool that the brain does. It seems to be in about the second or third stage of sleep, those cycles when we go into that low level of sleep and that really deep one and then coming out again, is... There's a time in the middle of the night um, when the top of the spinal column actually opens up and it passes a fluid across the brain and kind of washes or anesthetizes, so to speak, our emotional res the residue of chemicals from the, the emotional aftermath of what we experienced. Now, that's why people with post-traumatic stress, for instance, that doesn't happen. So they're constantly getting disabled in that processing um, process which isn't that really cool i didn't actually know that it's um so this is really important and also if you're learning say you know because we know the more facts and figures and um we're able to share with people just those little snippets it, we have more authority when we're on the street and someone says yeah but how many animals are dying a year we're able to say that off the top of our voices there you know rather than someone they can't have that unconscious belief oh it's just a, a, an opinion you have when we're learning that it's better not to, to burn the midnight oil and be doing that is learn something, then go to sleep. 
Because what we also find is when people sleep, it consolidates memory. Okay, and we know this with little babies. If you try and teach them, you know, say playing with a puppet. So you get a puppet, um, a psychologist is doing some tests with them or something. Mum's holding baby or dad or friend or whatever. And they get a puppet and they play around with a puppet. Say a six month old baby. Um, half the group or one side of the experiment, they put the babies to bed and the other ones, they let them stay up and play. When the researcher then gets the toy and then starts playing with it again, the babies that slept take the toy and they mirror what the researcher did. The babies that didn't and they stayed up, they just start flinging the toy around. OK, so when we're trying to learn something and, and people here will be students as well, you might as well, you know, our time is short. We're doing activism as well is do your studying, get a good night's sleep. Don't stay up till two in the morning doing this. Your exam results will be much better. I wish I'd learned that. The, I think I learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, I've had a problem with staying up late. But like I said, the biggest thing that I did recently for my health is just making sure, you know, you get to sleep on time. Another thing I found that enables me to have a better night's rest is exercising through the day, you know, doing at least some kind of exercise every day um, yeah. helps you to feel kind of worn out physically when you do actually mm -hmm. sleep. Um, also not looking at my phone at least 30 minutes before I am lying in bed and about to sleep because it tricks your brain into thinking it's still daytime when there's light shining yeah. in your face. Um, your brain and your body doesn't really shut down. It's still running and you can feel it. So in order to really just bring the vibes down and so that you yeah. can have like a proper REM sleep, that's another thing that's really important. So these are physical tips, Yeah. you know, physically, how do you behave um, to, you know, have a stronger sense of mental health. Um, a lot of people generally are asking questions about how to deal, like how to stay strong essentially in dealing with the two culprits, non-vegans and vegans. I actually think vegans are a bigger culprit <laughs> in terms of what we have to deal with in this fight for animal rights in our world. Yeah. But obviously non-vegans are a big issue. Um, how do we stay strong in all of this? We've talked about physical tips. Um, yeah. A lot of what we're a lot of what we're talking about is an attitude change, essentially, yeah. to how we view this. So it really does come down to perspective. As I think, the main thing that we all need to take into consideration: what is our perspective on things here? I think a lot of vegans read things the wrong way. You know, um, for example, we think that if someone is our family they should become vegan because they're our family. But why do we have that perspective? Why do we think that they're going to listen to us over and above a stranger listening to us? Um, I know that our family, we have more of an affinity with, but what I've found is actually the opposite. Family find it harder to take these this kind of a message from someone, especially my parents, from someone like me, because I think Gary pointed this out really well. Parents have this ego issue, like, oh, God forbid I get something wrong and my own children correct me on this. And it's not just a small thing. It's something they've been doing their whole lives and it's obviously very much immoral. In fact, the biggest injustice on the planet. More bloodshed than any other injustice on the planet. And they're responsible for a great deal of bloodshed yeah. regarding that injustice. So for them to face that and to be like, oh, I've been wrong all these years. I raised you wrong and you're right. That becomes an ego battle in, in your family's head. So I think we should have a better perspective about family. This is just one example of how we should change our perspective. Yeah. And when it comes to family, we should just understand they're human beings, just like anybody else. Just like we're asking you to consider all vegans as just human beings. Don't necessarily think they're your comrades or your allies. Same thing with family. Don't necessarily think they're your, they're your you know, prime candidates for becoming vegan when you talk to them about this. You do have to understand that your parents may not go vegan. Acknowledge, accept, 
take that on the chin, bite the bullet, understand that that's not something you necessarily have the control over and focus on your circle of influence, the things that you actually do have control over. Otherwise, you're just burning yourselves out for no reason and you don't deserve that. You're doing it to yourself with your perspective, but you don't deserve that. You don't need to put yourself through that. We're born into this world, right, Claire? We get a certain with a certain hand of cards dealt to us, but we didn't create this shit that we're in right now. You know, we're born into a family. We're dealing with this injustice. We were programmed with this nonsense ourselves to think that animals are here for us and not with us. We are guilty of being programmed by a corrupt system. Um, so we're just doing our best to fight for the animals and to fight for what's right and to essentially fight for truth. And like I said in the last post, so, and so my point there is um, you don't bog yourself down with a sense of responsibility for things you don't have control over. Do your best. Keep moving forward. If your family don't listen after multiple attempts, if they stop asking you questions, fuck it. Keep moving forward. Keep focusing on those who will act. That's what I do. And that's what keeps me strong. That's the best advice I have. Uh, on the last, on the last stream, I'm, um, I was mentioning, oh, I forgot my stream of thought there. Um, I was going to say, yeah, it'll come back to me. But if you have anything to add to that, Claire, I think the perspective is key in this line of work. Um, oh, that's what I was going to say. It came back to me. You know, in the last stream, I was saying that essentially we are mediums of truth. And like George Orwell said, when a society drifts so far away from truth, people become angry at those who speak it. And that's why people are angry at you. That's why people shut off when you talk. I also just want to say that there are plenty of people that are out there who will act. And that is a perspective change that everybody in this stream, anyone who's watching this can adopt yeah. immediately and should adopt because I've noticed in doing this for five years on the streets, talking to thousands of people by now, that it's a numbers game. Some cubes I have a tremendous amount of people who, who are listening, who are willing to become, you know, to become, to have their thoughts challenged and to become vegan. Um, some cubes, I, by the end of it, I'm just beat. You know, I'm so tired of talking to these non-vegans. The same excuses they think is so original and you just, you, yeah, it's draining. I, I get it. It's so, it, it's such a draining experience to go through that time and time again over all these years. But essentially, I understand that if I keep going, the next person I talk to could be that person that I, you know, I will see them really understand it and move. And some cubes, I only get one person and that one interaction I have the whole day just gives me life, you know, it just gives me so much energy to continue moving forward. So that's the other perspective change I want people to understand is that mm -hmm. there are so many people out there that are willing to listen. And even the people who talk shit, like these trollers that are currently in the comment section, um, just blocking them as I talk to you, Claire. Um, you know, even these people, the fact that they're on a vegan stream, right? An animal mm -hmm. rights live stream, talking shit in the comments. Why would they be doing that if they're not at all like bothered by the truth mm -hmm. of what we are speaking, right? the the truth that we represent which is that which is a simple message animal abuse especially where it's needless is wrong very simple very very truthful and if yeah. someone yeah they feel guilty like nelly's saying in the yeah in the comment it comes from a place of guilt so again a perspective change you know we need to understand what we're seeing don't read things the wrong way it will only burn you out claire what do you have to say to that now, I totally agree with you. And I think um, one uh, something that I think people say, I hear it a lot, is I can't believe people don't care. And they almost feel that the people have felt and seen what we've seen and they go, nah, don't bother me. I, I say to people, often people will have this amazing, what we call psychic defenses to ward off the feelings that we get when we see that and that we've acted on. 
this enormous distortion, which has probably been learned at other times in their life when they've had to face painful things, whether it's in their family, whether it's humiliation from a teacher or bullying in the schoolyard, people cut off that something. And so it's not that they're looking and feeling and going, nah, it doesn't bother me. They won't let themselves feel it. And often when people say the most outrageous things to us, I think it's because they want to say something so outrageous that we'll just back off and stop talking. And remember that too, because some people don't want to be that self-conscious in front of us. And that's why I've always advocated the AV mask um, is so powerful. Because when we somebody sees our face and we're saying, well, what do you think of this? They have to experience um, what they're feeling, the horror in the light of them being observed by someone they know is going to say, well, you can do something about it. And so but when the mask is there, they are forced to feel their own feelings and reactions in relation to the material. Now, our family come with a whole new bag of kettle of bonkers. OK, because they've got a whole sort of history of, um, you know, they remembered, you know, they knew you when you fell over the kitchen step or whatever. And then suddenly, you know, I think a lot of parents struggle with their adult children anyway. <laughs> um, but when we're challenging them on these things. So I think it is about perspective. I think it's about no means not yet sometimes. Know when to say enough to people and just get them uncomfortable enough that they've actually, it gnaws away at them. So that's really important too. So thoughts are things. I think that's something we've brought up today. Something I do want to pick you up, uh, not you on personally, but you mentioned staying off social media, staying off your computer at night is, and half an hour is a small amount of time. I'd say an hour. And the reason is there is a blue screen there. It affects the... And melatonin and in, in, in the brain and things we do think it's um, daytime and we it wakes us up again with the because you know sleep is a chemical reaction so if we're activating hormones that force us to go against our sleep that's going to be limited turn your wi-fi off at night it's almost like um, a brilliant documentary called resonance it's almost like sitting in a microwave and when we slow our brain waves down and we're relaxing and we're sleeping if we've got that going on that is going to be far more agitating. Okay, you can still put it on, put it on air flight mode. Your, your alarm will still go off. But if you've got that in the background, I'm sure at some subliminal level it's affecting us. But it agitates us. Okay, so mm. make sure that's off. So we've got the physical, we've got the emotional. Um, on my website, veganpsychologist.com, I've done a particular meditation for vegans. It's only 10 minutes, but it's based on the neuroscientific principles to slow the brain wave down, to move it to we can have a, a, a trigger almost to move us to that place when we're agitated by these ridiculous comments. Um, rather than us having this template to immediately sort of go into the negativity. It is, I think there's routines and disciplines we can put in place to just keep putting that credit back in the bank so that we can get out there and keep advocating and being part of the solution. And we always remember a rising tide raises every boat. So there's people all over the world where where it is a numbers game. And it is when we meet, reach a critical thing, we know this in all social change because most people are gonna follow. Most people are not, we're the innovators. We're the people, the 2.5% who are going against the norm, you know? And once it reaches about 2.5, 2 point a little bit more, it goes into what's called the early majority. Um, and isn't the early, no, there's another group there, the innovators, the, um, early adopters, that's right. And that's about 16%. Then we start to get a massive shift. Will people change their consumer habits all for ethics? I don't believe necessarily everybody will, but if they change their behavior, they'll go along with the norm. Our job is to hold that vision. Um, you know, I want everyone to become vegan for the right reason. <laughs> um, but some people are just gonna change because that's what everyone does. That's why they're doing eating the diet that's killing them, certainly causing agony to animals and destroying our planet. And how, how much crazier is that? You know, people aren't even doing their own homework. They're just going, well, that's what we've always done. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we've covered some really good stuff, Claire. Um, mm -hmm. Stacey's asking if she should turn her router off altogether, um, the internet. Absolutely. I would say, if you go and watch the documentary free on YouTube called Resonance, it'll make you turn your router off without a doubt. Yeah. Mm. Um, but on the same token, I want to um, also say 
don't become too paranoid about your mobile phone, having it in your pocket, using it, putting your phone up to your head. That can also be an issue. Um, there's no, I don't think there's any um, definitive science on it harming you necessarily, but definitely for sleep, I always have my phone turned off, um, the internet, like yeah. the router. Um, I don't um, do this now, but I used to always turn it off. And I think it's a good idea because it's not being used anyway. So yeah, yeah. why not turn it off? Um, yeah. Somebody's asking about your website. Yes, it is veganpsychologist.com. Go over that go over to that website and check out the meditation. What else can we offer to those who yeah. are part of this? Yeah. Well, there's a free 30 day video program called vegan voices. Um, and that's going to help more with talking to the family, talking about all the stupid comments we have because activism, we know being on the street is very different. We're talking about the real cutting issues here but when people say the most ridiculous things you know if we don't eat animals they overrun the planet and all that nonsense you know um it is a 30-day program there which also is based on active listening skills and good communication so not only are you going to be able to answer that question we're going to have to answer similar questions to it okay and you get one per day and then or you can just download the whole sort of lot um there's that one there's a overcoming stress and anxiety program on there an audio program you can get hold of um and then the, um, one of my books is called Myths of Choice, Why People Won't Change and What We Can Do About It. There's a free four-part course, which is called, um, which really just looks at myths, unquestioned assumptions, the why people go along with, I should do that, I must do that, I ought to do that. All the ridiculous comments we have is why will people won't change. If we can get to the essence of that and also see where we do it in the other areas in our lives, we're going to be able to just shape our conversations better. So that's veganpsychologist.com forward slash myths. But if you just go onto that main website, look at resources and things like that. There's a lot of free resources on there and then there's other things you can access. And um, and I know, you know, Paul, you and I are going to be looking together, looking at these comments again, is putting together something really on resilience and mm. pulling together some of the themes we've had. But I think there's two aspects to this of our mental well-being is is self-awareness is everything that happens in our lives we have to ask what is my part in creating it okay is nobody can offend us or upset us without our permission yes they give, give us a load of grief but ultimately we have to react you know paul if your brother upsets you he could say exactly says something to you and presses a button he could say exactly the same to me and it won't affect me if my brother says something to me it'll affect me and it won't affect you so all of us our, you know, we have history, it presses buttons, whatever. And so our self-awareness is going to be really important. But our awareness of what is, you know, what are our reactions? How do we respond to people? Where have we got blind spots? The more in putting that credit, as I say, in the physical and emotional bank. The next bit is becoming a really good communicator across time and situation. Because if we walk away from every conversation, um, either on the street or with our family, just saying one comment that we know rocks their world, sometimes less is best, okay, is we know we can do that, that's gonna help our mental health because we know today we did the right thing, we pushed it in the right direction. I always use the animal in the cage, the animal in the experimental lab, and I use them as my judge. Could I look them in the face and say, I did the best for you in that conversation? Or did my ego get in the way and I just wanted to score, score points. I was sarcastic or patronizing. Made me feel good for a few minutes. You know, we're human, but it leaves you with a horrible feeling. And the animals go, yeah, but what did you do for me? Did this result in the cages being thrown out? And I think it's important to ask that. So self-awareness and communication. I say there's some good tools and techniques that, you know, um, you can access um, and, and listening into the workshops that Paul talks about, there's some really rich stuff in there that Paul and Michelle do. So, you know, please do that. Yeah. And there may be, yeah. And what I teach in the workshops I do is what I have learned to be the most effective way to get people to seriously consider becoming vegan. Um, and in the shortest amount of time possible. Um, but I'm always looking for ways to improve on my communication. I don't think I've reached the end goal yet. Um, based on five years of doing work on the streets and 
you know, learning from others in the movement who have laid out a blueprint, if you will, and those who have done a lot of work before me. Um, so I learn from everybody. But some of the things that Claire will be able to teach you on our website may help you in certain situations with communication and also understand context is important. If you're at work, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you run the outreach approach that I'm teaching you in my workshops mm -hmm. because it's mainly geared for being at Cubes of Truth and many other situations, but it's mainly like a confrontation um, approach, um, holding non-vegans accountable. Um, and I believe strongly in the fact that, and I say this in the workshop, that the approach I'm teaching is compassion. It is love. Vegans don't get to say that what I'm teaching is violent or is hateful. Uh, it's just not true. So I refuse to accept that. What I'm actually teaching is compassion and it is um, the best thing that you can tell people. But context is important. Um, I think the biggest thing we've touched on in this live stream is perspective and self-care in, in terms of meditation, your physical health. Um, but perspective seems to be the biggest thing we've touched on here. And yes, we will read the comments back. Um, we'll wrap this up now, but we'll read these comments back on, fa on Facebook because they will stay there indefinitely. We've been reading all your comments here on Facebook. I'm sorry, on, on Instagram, because that's where Claire and I are currently live. And we're going to consider, um, based on your comments and what we've discussed here, um, what else we can possibly do for you guys. And we'll make a post on the AV page on Instagram and Facebook to let you guys know what that is. Just give us a few days to work it out. Does that sound good, Claire? Yeah, that sounds good to me. And, uh, you know, we're looking at... Um both you know how do we develop the resilience in people and there's some really cool things we can do some practical exercises you know based on i always think science catches up with common sense sometimes with some really cool stuff about how we bring the resonance of the head and the heart together that literally changes our whole physical and emotional well-being really cool stuff but then also you know if we can have the tools to have feel more empowered in every conversation that's going to help our mental health we know when we walk away we've had a good conversation and with family with work situations in one-to-one -one relationships all those sort of things um if we feel we are empowered you know i think that goes a long way because feeling hopeless or feeling we're not making a difference it'll never happen how we and that's also important as well anyway we i know we're going to be wrapping up but yeah we'll look together in the next um you know, coming days sort of thing and, and put something out there for people to, um, you know, choose to access, you know, that's going to be good. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put it in the comments as well on Facebook for the actual video post, but we'll also make a separate post on Facebook. Someone asked what our Facebook is. It's anonymous for the voiceless. Um, Stacey's asking, where can I watch carnage? It's a documentary that should be online. You can find it. I'm not sure what platforms it's on or available on uh, I hope you can watch it on YouTube, but I'd understand if the makers made it something you have to pay for. They uh, produced it at a high level. It's a really well done. It's not even a documentary. I don't know. I don't know if I called it one, but it's a movie. And um, yeah, you you can find it online. I'm sure. Um, someone's asking when is the next Cube of Truth in Scotland. You have to check on our website by going to the location section and then looking for the chapters near you in Scotland. If there isn't one in Scotland near you, then you can sign up to become an organizer through our website in the join section. Thank you guys for joining. This was a very helpful discussion for me too. So yeah. I hope that you guys got value out of this and we'll follow up on Instagram and Facebook, like I said, with some more helpful tools for you guys. Much love. Great. Thanks, Claire. Yep. Thanks to you and everybody. Keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, and thanks for being here. And thanks for being on the streets. See you later.